thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here and to witness the explosion of interest in global health issues here at the University of Wisconsin. As Ahaji mentioned, uh, the topic that Dr. Levitt and I will be addressing this evening is uh, the fourth millennium development goal, which is to reduce child mortality. And although this goal is very important and we've made much progress, though as we'll see, much progress to, remains to be made, um, I want to address in my uh, comments this evening that we also need to look beyond just reducing mortality and focus on the quality of life um, and the health of children who survive. Now, on the topic of child mortality, we need not uh, travel the world um, to find work and progress to be made. We can look here in our own backyard. And what's shown in, on this uh, graph are the recent trends in, child, in infant mortality, which is a major component of child mortality here in the state of Wisconsin. And you can see enormous disparity um, between black and white infant mortality rates and, and uh, across other ethnic groups as well. In fact, the black-white disparity in infant mortality in Wisconsin, I think, is among the highest in the United States. And the infant mortality in black infants is on par of the overall infant mortality rates in countries like Mexico, Jamaica, and, and Russia. And um, I know that the the university is already making great efforts in this area, and we hope that we can see this disparity be eliminated in our lifetime. Now, in terms of big questions, I have three uh, in mind. And these questions underlie my own thinking about global health and, m and much of the work that I do in this area. And I wonder if these are things we might develop um, consensus around or, or at least discuss. So first. What is the ultimate goal in our work in global health? Is it to improve human health and well-being in their own right? Or is health mainly important as a determinant of global economic development? In our last incubator session, Professor Poloni seemed to be argue that the main reason that things like breastfeeding and childhood obesity are important is because through various steps, he showed how they lead to decrements in um, economic development. And this perspective actually permeates most of the work done in global health in the United States. And I just raised the question, is it possible that um, meaningful progress on issues like child mortality won't be made until we have a reorientation in our thinking in this respect? And maybe we need to design economic systems to support human health and child development and other outcomes like environmental sustainability rather than having it the other way around, which is too often, I think, how we think of things. So that's one big question. Another, um, a second overarching uh, question pertains specifically to today's topic of child mortality. And the question here is whether the goal of reducing child mortality is sufficient. Or um, we know from previous experience that when child mortality declines, the importance of, of quality of life and the health of children who survive emerges as, as a, a major public health priority. So is it time to be thinking about this? That's my second main question. And then thirdly, um, I hope we'll have time to discuss just what is the role of the University of Wisconsin in global health and in issues like child survival. Is it to just confirm the status quo? Or should we be um, looking to break new ground, be innovative, as, as has Haji mentioned, on advanced knowledge to improve children's health globally, and here in the United States, here in Wisconsin? Now, before we can really talk about the fourth millennium development goal, which is to reduce child uh, mortality, we need to define um, what, what the main indicator used to monitor progress toward this goal, and that's um, child mortality or the under five mortality ratio. Um, and this is the probability of dying be before the age of five years per hundred, per thousand live births. So we, this is technically a ratio rather than a rate because the numerator, the number of children dying, infants and children under the age of five who die in a given year, is not fully included in the denominator, which is the number of live births occurring in the same year. 
Now, the under five mortality ratio is UNICEF's flagship indicator for monitoring children's health and human rights. For the right to life is the most fundamental of the human rights. And globally, most deaths to children are preventable. So failure to prevent these deaths, in a way, can be viewed as a violation of human rights. The under five mortality ratio is also used very widely um, as a general indicator of a country's development. If you think about it, a society that cannot protect the lives of its children is not a very viable or successful society. Now this Gapminder map or graph shows how at a country level, the under five mortality ratio is strongly correlated with the human development index. You can see that the countries of the world pretty much line up such that as the human development index in increases, the under five mortality ratio declines. And this should not be surprising because the HDI or the human development index actually includes its life expectancy, which of course is highly correlated with under five mortality. But I think the way that the countries line up, the human development index also includes indicators of education and, and economic development. So the fact that the countries line up so straight like this, I think is evidence of the strong connection between under five more child mortality and uh, both education and economic well-being. Now we can see from this graph that on the positive side, every single region of the world has ex experienced major declines in child mortality since the 1960s. In some regions, the decline is much deeper than others, and today we still see large disparities between regions on this indicator. Now, turning to the fourth millennium development goal, which is to reduce by two-thirds between 1990 and 2015 the under five mortality ratio, we can see that progress has been mixed. Developed countries are relatively low under five mortality ratios to begin with, and they're generally on track to achieving a two-thirds reduction by 2015. Whereas in the developing countries and the world overall, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. We're really not on track to achieving this goal by 2015. To, be, to reach this goal, we would have to see much steeper declines in child mortality than what we've seen. And it seems like it'll take a miracle or a major advance in knowledge or a major public health innovation for the, this millennium development goal to be met within the next four years. And this map shows that which countries um, are not on track or have made insufficient progress toward the fourth millennium development goal. And you can see that these countries are mainly concentrated in Africa and South Asia. Why uh, so much of the world geographically looks in green here, it looks like it is on track, and yet overall the world is not on track toward meeting this goal. Um, this of course is because most of the world's population is concentrated in these countries of, uh, located in Africa and South Asia, and particularly the, world, the child population of the world is concentrated in these areas. This graph shows um, trends in, in population growth in, worldwide in recent decades, and you can see that the proportion of the world's population living in developed countries has remained fairly constant, whereas the proportion living in developing, under less developed regions is increasing steeply, so that by now about 80% of the world's population live in low and middle income countries. And this is even a greater uh, difference for children, it's more like 90% given the age difference in the age structure of populations between the less and more developed countries of the world. When we consider the distribution of deaths to children globally, the ratios are even more extreme. Basically, almost all the ex infant or child deaths that occur globally, 99.7%, occur to children living in low and middle income countries. About, um, and this was most recent data, 2009, um, in the same year, about 90% of all births occurring in the world or work occurred in these countries. So the point here is that I think it's important to note that when we're talking about child mortality and child health in general globally, we're really talking about children living in low and middle income countries for the most part. 
looking at the proximal causes of child mortality, we see that many of them are, are preventable with known technology, such as vaccines, bed nets, oral rehydration therapy, antiretroviral therapy, injury prevention strategies, and that sort of thing. Although we know how to prevent these deaths, not enough is being done on a global scale. We've, seen, we've been less successful in addressing the distal causes of child mortality, of which there are many, and we mentioned poverty and education as being some of them, but also a crucial underlying cause of child death globally is undernutrition. According to the most recent data available, 23% of children under five worldwide are moderately to severely underweight. Another interrelated factor is children's exposure to war and political instability. Listed here are the five countries with the highest under five infant mor or child mortality ratios in the world. In Afghanistan in 2008, it was estimated that more than 25% of children would not reach their fifth birthday. A common denominator in all five of these countries is the exposure of children to war. So thinking beyond just survival of children, um, even though we haven't achieved the, the fourth millennium uh, development goal, and it, a sufficient reduction in child mortality worldwide is probably a long time coming. But I don't think it's too soon to begin thinking about the health and quality of life of children surviving. Um, two perspective, perspectives on this are what we could refer to as the epidemiologic or public health perspective on the one hand, and then the human rights perspective on, on another hand. And according to the epidemiologic transition theory that was expounded many years ago by Omran, reductions in child mortality lead to increases in the prevalence of chronic conditions. And another way of this, this is expressed is in terms of the expansion of disability hypothesis. The human rights perspective is articulated in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states in Article 6 that every child has a right not only to life and survival, but also to development that is achieving uh, developmental milestones and becoming a functional member of society. We have found some evidence to support the expansion of disability hypothesis in Bangladesh, where I've, I have been fortunate uh, to work and where some of the most rapid declines in child mortality have been achieved. Bangladesh is one of the countries where we pioneered the use of the 10 questions screen for child disability. And what we see here during the same period where declines in child mortality were documented are increases in the percentage of children two to nine years screening positive for disability. Now the 10 questions screen has now been used very widely across the globe and it's included as an optional module in the UNICEF's um, multi-indicator multi uh, surveys. And in 2009, two UW-Madison students, uh, Carissa Gottlieb and Matt Maynard and I, worked with UNICEF to analyze data that they generated on child disability. And we produced this report, Monitoring Child Disability uh, in Developing Countries, along with a corresponding paper published in The Lancet. And one of the main findings was that the median a median of 25% of two to nine-year-old children in the 22 countries surveyed screened positive, uh, indicating that they were at, at high risk for childhood disabilities. This and other work done using the 10 questions and other tools has brought attention to child disability as an emerging and important global health priority. An alternative approach to actually measuring the frequency in the population of disabilities is referred to as the Disability Adjusted Life Year Approach, and, or DALIs. And the, DALI, the DALIs are the sum of life, years of life, sorry, the years of life lost, YLL, prematurely, and the years of life lived with disability for a given population. The goal of computing these DALIs is to quantify the total burden of disease and disability in a population. And so in this sense, it tries to go beyond just deaths and count quality of life. 
However, the calculation of dallies is in many ways problematic. Instead of real data, it is based mostly on the opinions of panels of experts asked to make value judgments about how disabling various conditions are. The value judgments are elicited using person trade-off questions and then, these, and then used to give disability weights to various conditions. For example, experts are asked, if you had a given healthcare budget and you could use it to extend the life for one year of 1,000 people without disability, how many people with disability would you want to save that would be equivalent to those 1,000 uh, without? And for example, for blindness, the panel consensus was that saving about 2,500 um, people without blindness would be equivalent to saving 1,000 with. Uh, here's an example of how the DALIs are used to estimate impacts on mortality and disability that are attributable, say, to climate change. Now, there have been many, many ethical and methodologic objections raised um, about the DALI approach, and yet it's still the, one of those most widely used indicators, and we teach it here at the University of Wisconsin without really questioning it too much. Um, one of the ethical objections, for example, is that it includes age weights, which um, give less weight, less value to the life of infants and children and, and of older people than to people of working age adults, just as just one example. But the system as a whole ends up diminishing the importance of disabilities occurring in children. Fortunately, there are other approaches out there, and one of them um, is the perspective of the UNICEF, which um, in their approach to disability, they focus on gathering valid statistical information and preventing disability when it's possible, and when it's not possible, promoting the well-being and inclusion of children with disabilities. Now, in conclusion, I want to just um, comment on how all of this relates to the role of the University of Wisconsin. And first, um, after considering the DALI approach to disability, I'm convinced more than ever of the importance of teaching students to critically evaluate the global health indicators that we use not only for scientific validity and reliability, but also for the political, economic, and ethical underpinnings of these measures. Second, the University of Wisconsin, with all of its schools and departments, has probably all of the expertise needed to bring about major improvements in children's health and development. This includes expertise to reduce child mortality as well as to promote the health and development of children who survive. The challenges are to harness this expertise, question existing paradigms, innovate, and find ways to collaborate across disciplines and break new ground. As we look to do this on a global scale, we shouldn't forget about the excess infant mortality in our home state of Wisconsin. And thinking beyond reducing mortality as a goal, Wisconsin has traditionally been a leader in children's health and in providing health care and insurance and services for children with disabilities. Researchers here at the University of Wisconsin have played an important role in all of this. And in the days ahead, let's hope that we can maintain this leadership role and continue to work to protect and promote the health and well-being of children here in Wisconsin and globally. Thank you.